Good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the Dickey Center. I know there will be people still uh, coming in, but I wanted to get started. And I want to welcome you to this third event in our centennial series on 1917. Um, the year of the Russian Revolution and the U.S. entry into World War I, which was certainly one of the key steps on the way to America's rise to be a global superpower. And I want to thank you for uh, joining us for this uh, effort at, uh, at uh, consciousness raising and uh, historical uh, uh, visitation, if you were. I particularly want to thank our uh, co-sponsors, uh, the History Department, Government Department, Russian Department, Film Studies, the Leslie Center and the Project on Political Economy. Um, I, I especially want to thank today's speaker, uh, Professor Margaret Darrow uh, of our own history department. And um, she will discuss uh, the war as it was experienced here on the Dartmouth campus. Uh, Professor Darrow uh, has been um, in the Dartmouth history department since she arrived in 1980. Um, uh, and uh, has uh, published two books. She's also uh, served as chair of the Department of History and of the Women's Studies Program. She's uh, published two books, uh, one, uh, French Women and the First World War, War Stories of the Home Front, and uh, another, Revolution in France, Family, Class, and Inheritance in Southern France. She's also written widely on um, the impact of the war uh, on women in France uh, in particular. Um, I should also note that she teaches H History 62, uh, the course on the First World War, and actually held a conference uh, in, uh, on Memorial Day of 2015 on exactly this subject, Dartmouth at War 1914 through 1918. Uh, every student in the class presented research on Dartmouth's experience in the war, and one of them even discovered uh, in just the kind of um, intrepid uh, research uh, that we love to see, an artifact that the Rauner Library did not even know it had, uh, the blueprint of the trench system that was to be dug uh, in the athletic field. Uh, <clears throat> my colleagues in history, I hope, will forgive me for using what has become one of the most hackneyed uh, quotations um, yeah, in the field, uh, the quotation from L.P. Hartley in The Go-Between, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. Um, well, the country that we're going to revisit is one that's both very foreign but also very near uh, since we, we live on its soil, and yet it's a, from a time, uh, we'll revisit a time that is indeed extremely different from our own uh, a time of unquestioning patriotism, uh, a time when Dartmouth, I think, probably felt much, much farther from Europe, and uh, a time of romanticism, a time of deference to power, a time of all kinds of illusions. But <laughs> well, we will find out. Anyway, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Darrow, and I look forward to hearing her lecture. Thank you, Dan, very much for that introduction. Um, I also want to thank uh, the, the, um, the Dickey Center for having, Dan and the Dickey Center for having asked me to do this talk. Um, Jay Satterfield and uh, Morgan Swan of Rauner Special Collections for having introduced me and my students to the wonderful, rich collection in Dartmouth's archives. Uh, of, about World War I, um, and particularly my students of History 62, the First World War, uh, whose research over the years uh, actually founds, is the basis of, of this talk. Um, particularly, I have some students in particular, uh, to thank Matthew Garvey of 99, class of 99, Addison Himmelberger, class of 15, and two current students, um, Allison Gelman, 18, and Scott Baum, Bone, 18. Um, and uh, those two I'm going to mention specifically when I come to the sections of the talk that are based on their uh, research papers. Um, in this talk, I wanted to explore uh, life at Dartmouth during the war. There are many fascinating stories of Dartmouth students in the war, uh, particularly in the Ambulance Corps and in aviation. 
um, but I'm not going to be talking about them. If you're interested in them, you need to go to Rauner. Uh, go to, there's a number of Rauner blogs about these students. Both of these pictures are from uh, uh, Rauner blog postings um, about Dartmouth students in World War I, and they're based on extensive papers and uh, letters, memoirs, photograph collections, et cetera. Uh, and there are, these are only two of, of, of many. Um, but the story that I want to tell today is about, uh, is about um, uh, on campus, uh, the experience of the war here in Hanover, and particularly the war for Dartmouth students. I was hoping there would be more Dartmouth students here, but as is typical, I'm talking to my colleagues and friends. But anyway, so you're, you're going to learn what it was like to be a student here, uh, 1914 to 1918. So first of all, uh, there are very few studies of the impact of World War I on universities and colleges. And the few studies that there are are about uh, European universities. Um, and for them, the wartime uh, disruption lasted for more than four years. And it had very serious long-term consequences. Uh, in some ways, Dartmouth's experience uh, uh, mirrors theirs in miniature, uh, because the US was only in the war for a year and a half. But in other ways, Dartmouth's experience is quite different. So for example, um, across uh, Europe, the war brought an immediate, drastic reduction of the uh, male student body. Um, if colleges, if universities wanted to stay open, they had to admit more women and they had to admit women to programs that had previously been closed to them. As you know, this didn't happen at Dartmouth. Uh, the number of students enrolled at Dartmouth um, did fall dramatically between the fall of 1916 and the fall of 1918, basically was cut by half. Um, but the war ended in November 11th of 1918, um, student enrollment went back up in the, fall, in the winter term, and so Dartmouth never uh, moved to that radical uh, change of coeducation. In European universities, the war reduced or eliminated student activities, sports, clubs, traditional festivities like banquets, um, and this occurred at Dartmouth as well. In 1918, the junior prom was canceled. That was the biggest social event on campus at that time. Um, uh, student clubs were closed, sports were curtailed, uh, the Dartmouth the, uh, newspaper um, ceased publication. The war also saw remodeled curriculum uh, of many European universities. So a traditional focus on the classics, on ancient history, on philosophy, uh, gave way to modern history, modern languages, and practical science rather than theoretical science. And we find some similar changes in Dartmouth curriculum during the war. For example, in 1914, there was a new course um, on the causes of the war. And later, there was a new major in chemistry, war chemistry, otherwise known as explosives and poison gas. But throughout the war, uh, historian Elizabeth Fordman, Fordham uh, argues, European universities struggled to keep some form of normal education alive. And in that, Dartmouth uh, really did not have much of a struggle. Dartmouth succeeded quite well until the fall of 1918, uh, when the campus became a military camp. So the story of Dartmouth 1914-1918 uh, moves from ignorance and indifference to internal debate to hesitant adjustment and then to complete but brief militarization, followed by a relatively quick and complete return to pre-war norms with the addition of a new culture of memorialization. So this is the story I'm going to be, um, going to be telling today. Although the war had major long-term uh, consequences for European universities, um, for example, co-education, as I've mentioned, at Dartmouth, the war's most lasting legacy is do you know? Memorial yes, Memorial Field, the football stadium. Dartmouth, uh, uh, Jerry is our historian of Dartmouth, so you have to shut up, Jerry. Okay. 
Um, so Dartmouth in the fall of 1914 was not the college uh, that it had been when founded by Eliezer Wheelock in the 18th century, nor uh, was it the college that it is today. Wheelock's Dartmouth was primarily, uh, primary educational mission was to educate the clergy, um, uh, like that of nearly all colleges and universities at that time. By 1914, Dartmouth's uh, educational goal had much broadened. It was to prepare young men for social, political, and economic leadership. But traces of Dartmouth's religious origins remained in required chapel and also in the Christian Association, which was the largest and most active student uh, organization on campus. The student body had also grown enormously since Wheelock's day, and particularly in the two decades prior to the, uh, prior to the war. Um, in uh, 1895, Dartmouth enrolled less than 400 students total. In 1916, enrollment was nearly 1,500. So it was an enormous increase in a very short period of time. Um, and the student body was no longer primarily from northern New England, as it had been, uh, but it drew largely from the suburbs of the cities of the East Coast and Chicago. The class of, uh, of 1916 included students from 36 states and seven countries. But by our standards, it was hardly diverse. It was almost entirely white, Christian, upper and upper middle class, and of course, it was all male. So on to the story of Dartmouth at war. So Dartmouth was on summer recess when the war broke out in Europe in August of 1914. When the college reconvened in September, the president, Ernest Nichols, uh, evoked the war in his convocation address. He asked assembled students to imagine what it would mean to you to have more than a third of your comrades gone to war, our chief halls made into hospitals for the wounded, broken, dying men. Such is the sad fate of Oxford and Cambridge. And he depicted a post-war Europe devastated and impoverished. Europe would need, he declared, America's, quote, material, intellectual, and moral resources to rebuild. Recalling what Dartmouth owed to Europe, he said, quote, there is not a course taught in Dartmouth College which does not reveal Europe's great intellectual contributions to our culture and civilization. And he called upon Dartmouth students, quote, in the name of humanity, to use the college opportunities to upbuild, to strengthen, to refine your native powers so that you may better help your brothers upon whom so vast and ruinous a calamity has fallen. <clears throat> in the meantime, Dartmouth added a course as I mentioned before, on the causes of the war. I would love to see that syllabus. And, but then it went on about its normal business. Um, the Drama Society, the Christian Association, and sports are what dominates uh, the student newspaper. Another difference between Dartmouth um, in 1914 and now is that in 1914, the Dartmouth football team ranked fifth nationally. Dartmouth, at this point, paid little attention to what was going on in Europe. Um, Alison Gelman's research on Dartmouth fraternities during the war found that until 1917, fraternity records scarcely mentioned the war at all. It's not anything that they talk about. There was interest in the, in, on campus in the war, but it was confined really to two organizations. Um, the first was the Polity Club uh, that sponsored an occasional lecture on the war. For example, um, it sponsored a talk, a talk illustrated with stereopticon slides. I had to look up what a stereopticon slides were, but anyway. Um, so it was an illustrated talk um, by a Japanese academic who was uh, defending Japan's attack upon uh, German colonies in Asia. So that was one source of interest in the war was the Polity Club. The other was the Christian Association, which became involved in relief efforts for Belgian refugees um, in the late fall of 1914. And the first sign that the brothers of Alpha Delta Phi knew that there was a war going on uh, was when at one of their um, house meetings in January 
one of their members urged uh, the fraternity to come together to gather clothing for the Christian Association's um, campaign for Belgian refugees. Um, the Christian Association had also funded and run a mission school in Marden, in what is now Turkey. This is something I didn't know about at all. It had begun in, uh, uh, in 1910. Um, and um, in the spring of 1915, they uh, became concerned that Ottoman requisitioning was leaving the school without, uh, short of resources and also short of labor. Um, there was not it meant any mention at that point of the atrocities against the Armenian population, which was actually the, uh, uh, the students of the school. Um, later in November of that year, there was an article uh, that said the school had been forced to close because of persecutions and deportations. Um, but back to the school year of 1914-1915. In March 1915, members of the Christian Association launched a much more ambitious relief effort uh, to fund and staff a Dartmouth Ambulance Corps on the Western Front. The plan was to affiliate the ambulance with the, Ameri the, ambulance with, uh, the American Hospital in Paris, with which Dartmouth had a connection because uh, via um, Edward Tuck, who was the funder of the Tuck Business School, um, and he was also a major uh, uh, benefactor of the American Hospital in Paris. So there was this kind of Dartmouth connection to the American Hospital. Um, each ambulance would cost between $600 and uh, $1,500 uh, and would need a crew of two. Um, the, the Dartmouth, the newspaper, on March uh, 29th solicited, quote, men who would consider spending the summer in this work. So it was kind of, you know, your summer term, go to Europe and work in ambulances in World War I. Um, and they were to see uh, uh, George B. McClary, class of 14, who was heading up this effort. In order to stimulate Dartmouth students' uh, competitive interest, the paper reported that Harvard had already funded uh, five ambulances while Yale had raised $9,000 and had funded 12, six which were to go to Germany and six to France. In May, a German submarine sank uh, the passenger liner, the Lusitania, killing 128 Americans. This was the first time that international news appeared on the front page of the Dartmouth. Um, one result was a surge of uh, in the fundraising for the ambulance. Uh, and by June, three Dartmouth students had joined McClary and uh, they took two ambulances to France. Also, in response to the Lusitania tragedy, uh, the preparedness movement gained in volume and in adherence uh, across the country. Um, this was trumpeted by the former uh, president, Theodore Roosevelt, and others. It, it's a very odd movement. It combined physical fitness, flag-waving patriotism, and uh, uh, military training. Um, and it was intended to strengthen American manhood threatened by a number of uh, awful threats like racial degeneration, socialism, feminism, and military weakness. Um, the latter recently uh, displayed in the U.S.'s semi-farcical efforts to hunt down Pancho Villa. So, uh, there's kind of a combination of things coming together here. Some of its proponents advocated U.S. intervention in the war on the side of uh, France and Britain, but for the most part, uh, the effort, uh, the movement was, um, uh, it's had very confused rhetoric and program, but, but to, to the extent that you can uh, tease it out, it was defensive. Uh, America needed to be prepared to defend itself it wasn't really sure against whom. Um, it, British attacks from Canada, that was one possibility. German submarines up the Hudson, Russian attacks uh, of Alaska. Uh, it depended on what preparedness speaker you were listening to, where the threat was from, but America needed to be prepared. Um, during the summer as well uh, in 1915 and then throughout the rest of the war, Someone or some ones at Dartmouth was receiving a deluge of propaganda, mostly from Britain, uh, promoting the Allied cause and demonizing Germany. And the library is full of this stuff. It, we have tons and tons of it. It's wonderful. Um, one of these pamphlets, uh, this one here, 
the deportation of women and girls from Lille, um, identifies the source, where this stuff came from. We don't know who it came to, but we know pretty much who it came from. It's identified in this book plate. Can you read this? Sir Gilbert Parker says, presented by Sir Gilbert Parker. Sir Gilbert Parker was the head of the America division of Wellington House, uh, the British propaganda factory in London. He was in, in, a head, in head of the division that produced uh, propaganda for the United States. And he was a popular, he was Canadian, he was a popular novelist. I have to confess, I'd never heard of any novels that he wrote, but um, he was a best-selling novelist at the time. Uh, and he had some correspondent at Dartmouth, I don't, or more than one, I don't know who. Um, so this is, this is, this is he. Um, and I, at this point, I should mention another Dartmouth student that I should have mentioned before, Julian Saltman, uh, class of 04, uh, who wrote uh, an honors thesis on Wellington House propaganda, or on Wellington House itself. Okay, so back to the story, uh, 1915. Um, we hear nothing about, uh, you know, we hear nothing about this propaganda. We hear nothing about the preparedness movement when the college uh, reconvened in September of 1915. Um, the president, Nichols, repeated the message of the previous fall, thankfulness that America was at peace, a call to Dartmouth men to prepare themselves for the greater, you know, post-war responsibilities um, in the world. Um, but a debate over preparedness uh, broke out in November. It broke out in the pages of the Dartmouth uh, with editorials and letters to the editor. Uh, the paper's editor stated on November 1st, quote, at a time when preparedness and the peace proposition are being actively agitated in large number of colleges and universities across the country, Dartmouth undergraduates should certainly not be the last to express an opinion as a body, either for or against armament or military drill in some form. And the editor was obviously in favor of military drill. But letters to the editor ran uh, consistently counter. So one said, the best way for Dartmouth to prepare for national defense is to create sentiment against war. And another letter called preparedness inflammatory and silly. I think he was right. Um, but when uh, students returned after the Christmas break, uh, they were stunned to learn that Richard Neville Hall, class of 15, one of the Dartmouth uh, ambulance crew had been killed while driving his ambulance in the Verdun sector in France. Until this tragedy, the campus had ignored the activities of the ambulances that they had funded. Not, there wasn't a word about them um, in the student newspaper. This new news seems to have spurred a vociferous minority of students to press the college to introduce accredited military training. In anticipation of official recognition and with the help of a couple of faculty, a group of students organized a Dartmouth battalion as an extracurricular activity. Um, enthusiasm for drilling uh, waxed and waned, mostly waned over the course of the term. Uh, the promised uniforms and rifles don't seem ever to have shown up. Uh, the battalion, the paper keeps announcing the battalion being reorganized, so it was clearly not on very sound footing. Uh, but the Dartmouth became, the newspaper became ever more and more militaristic. It blasted Dartmouth faculty for refusing to grant credit for military training. The editor blamed opposition from the, quote, small percentage of men who are either unwilling or unable to face tangible facts. We hope Dartmouth men, whose Americanism is of the red-blooded, vigorous type, which has made Dartmouth so large and, port and potent a factor in our national life in the past, will not fail to make their influence felt with the trustees. In fact, a campus-wide poll found that the majority of students were opposed to military training on campus. To the editor's uh, chagrin, the trustees ratified the faculty's decision not to uh, credit military training. However, after a heated faculty debate, a bare majority, apparently it was a very slim margin, did vote to grant college credit for summer military training courses at the Plattsburgh Military Training Camp. When the college uh, reconvened in 1916, it had the largest student body 
that had seen up until that time approximately 1,500 students. Dartmouth also had a new president, Ernest uh, Martin Hopkins. He did not mention the war in his convocation address, nor did the campus's appetite for preparedness reemerge. Um, the Dartmouth Battalion was not reconstituted. Football, the Drama Society, and the Christian Association returned to their dominant uh, position on campus news with one national edition. Can you think what it was? Fall of 1916? Government people? Fall of 1916? The draft? No. <laughs> no. What just happened in fall of 2016? Election. Presidential election. You need it's clues. Yes. So there were various local candidates appeared and spoke on campus. A Republican club, a rival, rival Wilson League was formed. They held rallies. Um, in a straw poll of students and faculty, we see an early instance of the Dartmouth faculty leaning to the left of Dartmouth students. Uh, student poll Hughes, the Republican candidate, beat Wilson almost two to one, and the socialist candidate got one vote. But in the poll of faculty, Wilson beat Hughes, and six faculty members voted for the socialist, Alan Benson. After the Christmas break, um, the national scene receded again from Dartmouth consciousness until early February when suddenly the Dartmouth announced that a near certainty uh, of a break with Germany over, because of the renewed submarine um, attacks. This is the first time that the Dartmouth began to publish regular articles of national and international news uh, supplied by the Sun Syndicate from Chicago. Until the US Congress um, actually declared war, Dartmouth students remained in a large majority opposed to the U.S. intervention in the war. A straw poll carried out in early March showed 80% of the students supported Wilson's policy of armed neutrality, but not entrance into the war. On the other hand, preparedness had by now won the day. 63% favored military training. <coughs> by mid-March, the faculty had reached the same conclusion and voted to create a course of military training as authorized by the War Department, but not for college credit. Um, at this point, the Dartmouth editorial commended this decision, said, quote, there is no reward, but no reward should be necessary. The present college generation should realize that its members cannot rest inactively on the laurels of Dartmouth men who fought in the Civil War. The responsibilities of maintaining the enviable standards set by these men now rest on the shoulders of the members of the present undergraduate body. Like Europe in the summer of 1914, um, the United States declared war while Dartmouth was in recess, uh, summer break. Um, when the students came back from their summer break, uh, they found a campus in turmoil. Some didn't come back at all. They had already uh, opted to volunteer. President Hopkins tried to dissuade hasty volunteering, calling upon Dartmouth students to show self-discipline and restraint and complete the year. Nevertheless, uh, the newspaper reported on April 16th that, quote, 160 fraternity men off for active war service. The, vo the faculty at this point voted academic credit for military training. And over 1,000 students now enrolled in the newly reconstituted Dartmouth Battalion, which was now called the Dartmouth Regiment. As pictures from the newspaper show, besides drill, the students dug trenches, created you know, these uh, barbed wire entanglements. And I love this picture because, I mean, here's the gym. I mean, you can identify where this is. This is, oh, this is the gym here. Um, so it's, this is out behind the gym where the I guess it's, what is that there now? It's like a ten, tennis courts? They were out there behind the gym? Or is that, is this probably where the, um, that, that, athlete, that baseball field, that, yeah. Yeah, where Levron is, I think. It's probably about there. Um, 
More Dartmouth students, uh, 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 100 in all, or approximately 100 in all, sailed for France in June to join the American Field Service, uh, the organization which had absorbed the Dartmouth ambulances. So faculty now in administration were confronted uh, with conscription, which was passed shortly after the declaration of war. And that would remove nearly the entire senior class. Convocation in September of 1917 saw less than 1,000 students enrolled. Fraternities also saw their membership cut. House meetings that the previous year had gathered 30 or more um, were now only nine or 10. And for the first time, they began to discuss the war. Members wrote letters to brothers already in service and discussed service options, joining the ambulance corps, joining aviation. As usual, Dartmouth students followed the career of Dartmouth sports teams, um, but the Dartmouth also printed nearly daily reports of what was happening in the war, and this made for some odd juxtapositions. As you notice, these two battle stories at the top, you have on the left, the British and the Germans, and on the right, Dartmouth and Yale. <laughs> the paper also printed letters from Dartmouth students and alumni in military service or in France with the AFS. On October 25th, a front page article uh, headline was, Dartmouth man is cited for bravery under fire. This was uh, a, a student by the name of Potter, class of 19, who was awarded uh, the Croix de Guerre for uh, uh, retrieving wounded um, under fire. The trenches that the Dartmouth students had begun to dig the previous spring now became a complicated trench system. And this is the blueprint um, that I was, uh, um, that Dan referred to here. Um, we don't know if they actually dug all these trenches. I mean, this is what was supposed to have happened, but in any case. Um, complicated system, um, complete with observation posts, barbed wire, machine gun nests. In November, um, the regiment staged a sham battle as a pregame show for the football game. So here's how Dartmouth the Dartmouth described it. Quote, Hanover today will be treated to a glimpse of real warfare. In the trenches at 1.15 this afternoon, a struggle will be fought between two companies of the Dartmouth regiment and the enemy. Under the command of Captain Lewis Keene, the Dartmouth forces will silence the enemy's machine guns, will blow up the enemy's trenches with mines, will repulse a gas attack, and will go over the top and capture Redoubt 512. This, the paper claims, would be, quote, an exact representation of the fighting which is taking place at the present time in Europe. Would that it were so. In the winter, Dartmouth students confronted um, the food conservation programs which were being promoted by the new U.S. Food Administration, dining halls and eating clubs pledged to observe the weekly meatless and wheatless days. There were other priva privations as well. The spring break was eliminated. Uh, the prom was canceled. And nearly every month saw a fundraising campaign um, by the Christian Association, by the Red Cross, uh, the American Library Association uh, collected donations of books for uh, army hospitals and camps. But in the middle of April, the biggest campaign of all came to town. Uh, this was the drive for the Liberty Loan, and it raised $96,000 in Hanover, 18,000 of which came from Dartmouth students. That's impressive. Since the summer of 1917, the college administration had been pushing fraternities to close their houses, in part to save fuel, but mostly to boost college finances, which had been really hit by the decrease in enrollments. Um, so what they wanted to do was increase the number of students in the dorms who would be paying uh, uh, you know, board and lodging. Um, the fraternities had, of course, resisted. But finally, a committee of fraternity alumni proposed that in the beginning of the fall term of the following year, 1918, um, students would no longer lodge in the fraternities, but they would still be able to use them to hold meetings and social events. Um, the students uh, protested, uh, but to no avail. They, they were, the houses were going uh, no longer to house them. 
Um, when, but when Dartmouth reconvened in September of 1918, um, the issue of the student of fraternity houses was the kind of smallest uh, part of the disruption. Um, this was an entirely new and dire situation because in August, uh, Congress had reduced uh, draft age to 18. And so that meant virtually all Dartmouth students were eligible for conscription. The student body now numbered only about 750, of whom half were freshmen. There were only 68 seniors on campus. The second major disruption was the flu epidemic, which hit the campus and the town. And this was a truly frightening disease. Um, the symptoms were so severe that doctors at first thought that it was the cholera or the plague. Um, it could kill in 24 hours, and some 500 million people uh, died of the flu uh, that year, uh, worldwide, not obviously in Hanover. Um, <laughs> but it also killed at Dartmouth um, in late September and early October of 1918. During the summer, um, the Army had placed a training detachment at the college uh, for instruction by Thayer faculty in telephone and telegraph operations, auto automobile maintenance, and construction. These men were housed in the gymnasium. As President Hopkins admitted later, he said, what seemed so good an arrangement, namely barracking the men in the gymnasium, and what would have been a fine arrangement in 99% of possible situations, turned out in this to be the one worst thing possible. In these close quarters, the disease passed quickly um, from man to man, spread from the Army trainees to the students, to the faculty, and into the town. There were 325 cases recorded in Dartmouth. 10 soldiers, five students, and one faculty member died. To stop the spread of the disease, the college canceled all public meetings, including a planned celebration of the college's 150th birthday, and kept the healthy students out of doors as much as possible. The outbreak abated uh, by mid-October, but the campus did not return to anything like normal. And for this part of the paper, I'm indebted to the research of Scott Bone, because the, the, the Army had taken over the college. All draft age students were inducted into the Student Army Training Corps, the SATC. Dorms were turned into barracks. <coughs> Reveille was at 625. I'm sorry there aren't more students here, just so you can appreciate how lucky you are. Um, Reveille at 625, and students had to assemble in uniform on the green in order to be marched to breakfast. Their days were minutely scheduled with required classes, drill, and supervised study hall. Students who had completed the summer training course uh, at Plattsburgh were enlisted to help drew, uh, drill their, their, the, the others. And, they were, and those students were offered advanced instruction in such subjects as um, artillery coordinating, coordinates, um, map reading, and hygiene. All freshmen took a course on war issues that was to explain why the US was at war. And that's another syllabus I would just love to have. Extracurricular activities were few. The Dartmouth ceased publication on October 7th, and except for an edition on November 12th, it did not return to publication again until after the Christmas break in January. Football did not entirely disappear. After all, this is Dartmouth. But there were intramural games, company against company, and also what the newspaper later called experimental games. I'm, I don't know what they meant by that, but anyway, experimental games uh, against SATC teams from Middlebury, Brown, and Penn. Third, the Army shut down fraternities, not only as living spaces, but as social spaces. Students protested, this time with support of their alumni. An influential alumnus of Phi Gamma Delta wrote to President Hopkins, that fraternity life instilled the very values of brotherhood, which were now more essential in wartime than they had ever been before. And there were letters from fraternity brothers um, then overseas with the military um, adding their voice to the protest. And this is uh, what I was thinking about deference to authority. You got a lot of not deference to authority here, a lot of protests from the fraternity uh, against their houses being closed, but they were closed. 
And the college experimented with the quarter system. Um, the year was divided into four 12-week terms uh, with students to stay as long as possible until they were called up. How this would have worked out in the long run is anyone's guess. But um, on November 11th, as you know, uh, uh, the armistice put paid to that plan. Um, the SATC was, this, was demobilized in uh, mid-December, and the college was left to pick up the pieces. So in the winter of 1919, the college returned to near normal. Students who had left Dartmouth for, mili for the military began to return. The college usually granted them enough credit for, for their war service so that they were able to graduate with their class. Campus spirit returned to the headline of the first issue of the Dartmouth uh, when it reappeared after the war, I mean, uh, in January, uh, declared, it was the headline, Outing Club Gives Out Winter Carnival Dates. So, you know, we're back to normal. Um, and announced that all college publications and clubs were set to resume. They were soon to be joined by a campus chapter of the League of Nations Association, uh, which proved to be both popular and active with mass meetings, speakers, and various workshops. And the newspaper carried almost daily stories of Dartmouth war casualties and commemorations. 111 Dartmouth alumni and students uh, died in the war. Um, 20, uh, 39 of them were killed in action or of war wounds, 21 of accidents, mostly in Air Corps training, 15 of the 21 in Air Corps training. This is what happens when you put football players in little airplanes, and they try to do the stunts that they've seen on air shows. Anyway, um, 51 of them by disease, so almost half by disease, mostly influenza. Nonetheless, by the end of the school year, sports, the Dramatic Society, and the Christian Association had returned to their traditional positions as top newsmakers. And the war and its aftermath <coughs> faded from view, except in memories and, mem and mem memorials. Dick Hall's family had donated what we can now only call relics, um, an identity plaque and shrapnel-torn red cross insignia from his ambulance, his blanket and cot, and a fragment of the shell that killed him. These were displayed initially in the outing club, but later when uh, Dartmouth, when Baker Library was built, moved to join the memorial bar relief to Hall uh, that was, was installed there, and it's, it's still there. So if you have not seen it, it's in the reserve, uh, entry to the reserve corridor. A few years ago, uh, library curators saw that the display was deteriorating and replaced it with facim uh, facsimile photographs and documents and removed some of the more macabre items uh, like the Red Cross and the shell fragment. The war had not faded from view for the college administration, which was left with a substantial debt from lost tuition. The college resorted to an extraordinary appeal to alumni touting the college's war record and calling upon the sons of Dartmouth to come to the aid of the old mother in the name of their fallen brothers. And they did. Um, they contributed more than three times um, what was normally raised by an alumni, by alumni giving, erasing the war debt and providing the seed money for Dartmouth's World War I Memorial, the athletic field and stadium, which was inaugurated in 1923. So in conclusion, 1923. The war's brutal impact on Dartmouth was brief. The loss of life, it's 111 out of approximately 3,400 students and alumni who served. It's relatively small, it's about 3%. But nonetheless, the war did mark the college. Succeeding classes would never again quite inhabit, uh, inhabit quite so complete a Dartmouth bubble. The world had intruded once, and everyone knew that it could and probably would do so again. So in a way, Dartmouth would be ever after prepared. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, Michael. Michael. 
and that is, oh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the actual designation of what the war was called uh, and when, because uh, in, in, I think in the early part of the war in the US, it was called the European War. Mm -hmm. And the British called it the Great War, and the French were torn, were they not, between Mondial and... Uh, uh, okay, okay. And, but the Germans, in the middle of the fall, started... Call, after the Turks got involved, the Italians mm -hmm. left the, uh, the Triple Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, and the Japanese got in. The Germans, by the middle of the fall of 14, were calling it a Weltkrieg. And so, and you know, and that was like, oh, you're not going to call it World War I until World War II has been designated a World War. And I noticed a Smithsonian uh, uh, book that calls it the Great America and the Great War. So this terminology, who, whose terms you use, has something to do not with which side you're on, but how you line it up in the seriatim. Uh, in the uh, Library of Congress, it was the European War, 1914 to 1918 for a while. You had to look it up that way. Uh, uh, so, I mean, that was, that was its subject heading. Um, I don't know what, it, what it's called at Dartmouth. And I, unfortunately, the picture that I took of the memorial, I couldn't get the whole, the whole memorial in, the, in my camera. Um, so, and I've forgotten what it says above it. But I should, does anybody know? Richardson's history was written in 30, 32, he says up there. Right. He used the phrase World War. He says World War. The reason I know it is I wanted to look up when he wrote about it, and I looked at it just this afternoon. The noon, okay. World War and right. Index yeah, okay. Huh. <clears throat> Yeah, Bob, you yeah, wait for the microphone there being, uh, yeah. yeah. No, I, I was struck by the, um, the Hun imagery. The what? Uh, the Hun in imagery. And so was there any, um, with German descended students meant to, um, I mean, was that, was that a difficulty internally? Was um, what a difficult, I'm sorry. The um, German, German students, uh, not from Germany, but I, I oh, know generally, right. There was that right. Was I mean, German was taught. Tension. There was there was German language being taught on campus at the time. As far as I I could tell by looking at curriculum, it continues to be taught, but I, I don't really know. I don't. It didn't find anything in the student newspaper about that. But we do get in, in this increasing. I mean, you get you. They had that report in the spring of 1915 that Yale was going to send six ambulances to Germany, which I'm sure they didn't actually manage to do. But the, the idea was at that point still to be nonpartisan. Um, but uh, that, that really faded uh, you know, during the next year. And I think this barrage, well, the sinking of the Lusitania was a big part of it. The other is this barrage of propaganda from Britain. Oh, yeah, from Britain. There's a few examples of German propaganda in the library, but not many. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, but I have a question about how the pro propagandas and different sort of diaries and these personal recorded belongings were belongings ended up in the library, basically. Yeah. You know, I don't know how the, I mean, I, we know who sent the propaganda. We don't know who got it here. But presumably it was somebody on campus, or maybe more than one somebody. So faculty, administrator, something. That was the way that Wellington House worked. They worked via connections. Um, with publishers, with friends, with, you know, uh, and of course Gilbert Parker, Sir Gilbert Parker was a well-known novelist at that point, so that's how propaganda got here. How papers got to the library, do you know, Fran? Uh, 
I think I'm more familiar with with the material that was received in the Second World War, but it, we might mm -hmm. surmise that it was the same idea that Dartmouth grads had such a, a sense of belonging here that they felt if they had anything of importance, they wanted to share it with the college. Mm -hmm. I know uh, working with World War II classes, uh, we found this huge cache of material that had been off-site for many, many years, and they brought it back to Rauner. Rauner went through it, I went through it, and we added a number of things. But it seems to me that it's mainly the, uh, the students' love for the place mm -hmm. and the sense of importance it, it held in their lives that they wanted this to be saved and they wanted it to be at Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. There's also, there's a whole collection of letters that were sent to the Dartmouth librarian whose name was Rugg, I think, um, and he, who was apparently very beloved. Uh, and uh, so there was, there were, uh, I mean, students, you know, when they were in France, uh, wrote to him and about their experiences and how they met up with other Dartmouth students at a little cafe in Paris and they sang Men of Dartmouth and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, there, so some of it, uh, that whole collection is because, you know, he was the librarian here. That's a wonderful collection. Yeah, Doug. So um, I assume that the issue of pacifism didn't come up in the in the materials. Oh yeah, no, it does. does. Particularly, I mean, in the uh, in the objection to preparedness. Oh okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. In lots of letters, I mean, the the Dartmouth is being, you know, rah rah. We have to have military training on campus. And, and there's and letters to the editor responding, no, you know, the way, the, you know, uh, the way to respond here is to, you know, not go to war. Um, so yeah, no, very, qu quite strong. And I mean, even, even, you know, in the spring of 1918, uh, until the U.S. declares war, you know, you have the vast majority of students who are not in favor of going to war. Yeah. You can't exactly say they're pacifists, but right. they're not, they're yeah, not in I, favor of going to war. I was seeing that as a difference between kind of not not taking an active position in, in right, pacifism. right. But a related question, a question that was related in my mind is well, uh, they, well, I should tell you another thing. They also had a Norman Angel came to campus to speak mm. at the kind of height of the preparedness brouhaha. So you know, in the fall, in the fall of um, so that was like in the fall of. Uh, I would have to go back and check it now. I think it's I think it's in the fall of '16. Um, so he, uh, Norman Angel was uh, the author of a book called the uh, the Great Illusion about uh, you know uh, you know that war will not get you anywhere. Uh, essentially, it was a you know major sort of publication, pre-war publication about the futility uh, of war. Um, and so he was a real sort of standard bearer of the pacifist movement. Um, and so he, he, he spoke, he came to campus. He was uh, um, brought by the Polity Club. Okay. Another question that interested me, was, it, was there a local newspaper and did, did it there speak, was, there's did it speak a, to campus, there's, town kind of? There's a Dartmouth Gazette, I have not read it. I have. I am not an American historian. I am not an historian right. of Dartmouth. But the students. The <laughs> I students, am a French historian. But the I only could do a limited amount here. But yeah. the students didn't get into that. Uh, the, into the. I don't know. I haven't. Uh, I haven't your, read. Your, your students. Are. Oh, my students. Your students. No, no. Research. I mean, I know it exists. Mm -hmm. I know it exists. And 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 Matthew Garvey, who worked, uh, uh, who did a, a an honors thesis on the track from football players to airmen uh, use that resource. But, but I, haven't, I haven't looked at it, so it's definitely another thing to look at if I were going to turn this into something professional, right? <laughs> well, thanks very much. This is really a wonderful story. Um, I'm wondering about the faculty. You focus primarily mm -hmm. on the students. I know one mathematician who went to Washington to mm -hmm. calculate 
ballistic trajectories yep. for the army. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the chemists who were mm -hmm. teaching about gas warfare. Mm -hmm. did, did any faculty members leave the campus to go be involved in the war effort in some They way? did. They did. Do, do you know about that? Yes. Elton Bennett Hartshorn, who was a uh, distant professor in chemistry at the time, went to work with uh, James B. Conant on, uh, on mustard gas. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the uh, Chemical Warfare Service. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he stayed with Conant for into the early 1920s, I think, before mm -hmm, he came back. Mm -hmm. Maybe about 1920. Mr. Conant did try become president of Harvard. Yes, yes, yes. Conant, of course, was a chemist uh, at Harvard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, there, there are more, too. There were actually quite a lot of Dartmouth faculty who did various war, you know, war stuff for the government. Um, there's a quite there's a chapter in the Dartmouth War record uh, about that. Um, I, I didn't focus on it, and I don't remember the details. But just to say that there were, and there's uh, there's a Dartmouth faculty uh, from the French department uh, who was uh, uh, a native of Alsace-Lorraine who volunteered for the French army and was killed quite early on. And there's, you know, write up in the paper about him. And it's a political science professor who who dies of the flu. And unfortunately, I can't remember his name. But yeah, R R Roberta. I'm just curious about when the uh, when the students came home. If we know uh, if if the war experience had maybe affected what they studied. If if there was any discussion on the campus about the experience of the war after the end of the war. Um, there's, you know, lots of articles, uh, uh, letters from, um, you know, from, from students and articles about stu students or alumni's war service. But in terms of, uh, you know, soul bearing about, you know, scars of the war or anything like that, n nothing shows up in the Dartmouth in any case. Yeah. Yeah, Dan. Um, <clears throat> I'm afraid two curveball questions. One okay. is, do we know if anyone fought on the German side who had been uh, at Dartmouth? Most I don't know. It's certainly possible, but yeah. I don't know. But you didn't come across yeah. it. And the other thing is, um, and this is really um, sort of off, off the subject, but in the middle of all this, the Russian Revolution does happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if in going through all the materials you did, you got any sense of how that was received on campus. Didn't see it. Word. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, asleep at the switch again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the Polity Club. I mean, you know, there's whole bunches of, of, of you know, more uh, uh, archival stuff. I'm sure there must be records of the Polity Club, and that would probably be the place to look. Yeah. Um, I have sort of a follow-up question, which uh -huh. occurred to me, and that is, the question of masculinity and maleness and war and the whole that red-blooded American yes. vigor. But yes. my question is: but you're talking about the build-up to war, and you say, well, sport, sports, all-male institutions. The army was an all-male institution. Dartmouth mm -hmm. was all-male. It was the fraternity, mm -hmm. brotherhood of man, not sisterhood of man. But anyway, I'm talking about uh, the feminine factor as in in reverse here because. The halt the Hun has the Hun up there with the woman and the child down there, and that's like Lille and mm -hmm. Liège and, and Louvain, and right. the women and the children are the victims. It's right. the Lusitania story. It's, right. the, it's Louvain. It's mm -hmm. Belgium. It's, but after the first Russian Revolution, the Kerensky government raised this battalion of women mm -hmm. called the Women's Death Battalion. Women's when Battalion of Death, yes. Russian, mm -hmm. When the Russian armies were deserting on the Eastern Front, mm -hmm. it was a symbolical effort to get the men to man up and stop deserting mm -hmm. by getting the women out there saying, well, we're ready to die for the right. motherland or the fatherland or whatever you want to call it. But we're, and some of them were mothers, by the mm -hmm. way. They weren't just like single mm -hmm. peasant women. And Okay, so you know the story. Mm -hmm. And my question is, like, where do you think this fits into the grand narratives about wars for motherlands and fatherlands and what you're really fighting about? Women 
and then women and children become especially powerful. Why? That's mm -hmm. why it's all in the propaganda. Mm -hmm. And yet, in a certain sense, bringing the women, you could have, instead of having uh, the American soldier up there trying to halt the Hun, you could have a Russian woman in the death mm -hmm. battalion. And the Germans knew that the Russian, the Kerensky government was doing this, and they had this very agonized debate about what do we do because of the symbolism mm -hmm. of this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I, you know, it's a big, sprawling question, but it was a big, sprawling well, war. Well, you, you what, should have come to my talk down in Heartlands uh, two weeks ago when I talked about women in the war. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, in, in, in 140 characters, do you think the male factor has migrated out of war because we have women come? I mean, you, you think it's still there? Uh, huh. It's just that women get into uniform and fight in combat units, and well, it's still you, there. Have you we, seen pictures of the Women's Battalion of Death? Yeah. I mean, they removed every possible sign of, sign of femininity, females. and yeah. they, you know, their speeches were, we are no more, we are no longer, you know, babas, we are soldiers. Which means you've got to look more male. Well, yeah, right. We are, we are ungendered. Right. Well, maybe that's yeah. where we're headed in war. Yeah. We can yeah. do away with yeah. both. Yeah. We don't have any Dartmouth women in the war. But that's, there were 124 Vermont women in the Army Nursing Corps, and three of them died. Mm -hmm. I the, the Army taking over the campus whenever, mm -hmm. whenever it was. You, you didn't get much context on that. Did they take over every campus or, or just Dartmouth uh, in, in New England? I don't know. There, as I said, there's so little research on universities at war, and it's all about Europe. I assume they must have taken them all. Uh, they must have taken over. They must have taken them over is my assumption, but I don't know. Uh, just a comment. I know that uh, President Hopkins uh, was serving in Washington as an, an office of that, and for World War II, he was of major importance mm -hmm. in getting the campus turned over to the Navy. Could you mm -hmm. just describe Hopkins' role in this, because it's related to the last question? Um, I don't know. All I know is what, what, what's contained in the Richardson right, is right. that he served as assistant to the person in Washington who was organizing industrial activity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that was a way of linking Dartmouth to the conduct of the war, mm -hmm. and he was very aggressive mm -hmm. in uh, World War II yeah. to uh, see he, there's, that Dartmouth... There, there's no evidence that in 1917 he was pushing for Dartmouth... Yeah. Uh, you know, for military training at Dartmouth, for, you know, any particular involvement. So I don't see it coming from, from the president. Uh, I, my suspicion is that it, it, it's coming from the War Department, but I don't know. Yeah, Steve. So, thank you. So following up on Bob's question, he's gone, I guess, but um, did, were students of German descent, did, did, did they face difficulties, particularly after 1917? I don't know. You, you don't know that one either. Uh -huh. I wonder if they still These are subjects for future research. If they still taught German. Yeah, I mean, they in, did. In, in the they Midwest, still taught, as in far the Midwest as you had to stop speaking German. I mean, my family, uh, they got, you got your barn painted yellow yeah, uh, if you yeah. spoke German. And you had to speak English. Yeah, I, I did have. I had a student in that in the class that Dan referred to that um, did research on the Dartmouth curriculum during the war, and, and German was taught as far as as far as he could tell uh, throughout, but you know was in the in the catalog. What what happened to you if you took German? I, I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> Lots of unanswered questions. I have too many, oh, I don't know, so yeah, 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 okay. Okay, thank you.